Hey guys, welcome back to today's video. Today is Wednesday, December 28th, 2022, and today we are going to be talking about the 2024 Senate elections. Now, you might be thinking, okay, we're very early on and we're already making a decision about what we can expect to see two years down the line in the upcoming November elections. Now, what I will say is that first things first, the way that I do my Senate projections is that I treat them on a month by month basis. It allows me to explore the possibility about an improvement or uh, not so much of an improvement for either side of the aisle as we traverse over the next two years going into the general election. And looking at our 2024 Senate map, we do have a general idea of how the overwhelming majority of these states are going to go simply by the merit of their not competitive natures. States such as Wyoming, Utah, California are never going to go to the party that is currently in opposition to the incumbents, which means we know how many of these states are going to go. There will be some hotly contested states, states with Democrats in solid red states, such as Joe Manchin in West Virginia and John Tester in Montana. But overall, we're working with a very similar environment, and this is the first time on my channel where we are returning to a class of Senate seats that I have already covered in a previous video. Meaning that in the 2018 midterm elections, I heavily covered the 2018 Senate elections in which the Democratic Party lost two seats in a blue wave year. Democrats still maintained a prominence uh, in a number of states that they really should not have, given that Donald Trump won 10 states where they had incumbents in in this election cycle. Democrats ultimately only lost four states with incumbents and then won two from the GOP, ultimately equaling out to a loss of just two by the Democratic Party. But the Senate election results being uh, now circling back, the 2018 map back again in 2024, sort of makes me excited about going into this election again. It is the first one where we are returning back to a uh, Senate election. I have never repeated a map when it comes down to Senate or presidential, obviously. I mean, the first presidential race I covered was the 2021, and now we're going to start to go into 2024. It really just reminds me about how far we've actually gotten with this channel, how long we've been making predictions, uh, and we are starting very early on, but quite frankly, that's exactly where we were back in 2017 or even in 2019 looking at 2020 or even uh, in 2020 looking at 2022. The great thing about this website called map.jacksonjude.com is that it allowed me to make an election prediction very early on, uh, or it tracked my election predictions from very early on uh, to look and see how things had changed over time. And honestly, this was my first ever prediction for the 2022 Senate elections. And in terms of inaccuracies, there wasn't much wrong with this circumstance. Uh, Lisa Murkowski didn't exactly win by an overwhelming amount. That's what was being attributed by the likely Republican margin. I mean, looking at this here, not any of these states were wrong. The only thing was that Georgia had not yet been decided by the time we had reached our Senate projection. But after the runoff, Georgia went blue. In fact, my first ever prediction of 2021 ended up being an exact copy of what we saw happen on Election Day. Fascinating, if you ask me. But the first ever prediction on December 19th, 2020, showing Democrats flipping Pennsylvania, maintaining their ground in Nevada, Arizona, Colorado, New Hampshire, Wisconsin, and North Carolina close, Florida, Ohio, and Iowa likely, is roughly what happened by the time we reached the election. In fact, my final projection ended up being more inaccurate than the first ever one, which is just very interesting to say the least. But... I'm only showing you this to say that the validity of a very early prediction sometimes ends up being even more accurate than after two more years of knowing information about the races. Uh, at the end of the day, American politics in a way is very difficult pre to predict, but in some cases is quite simple to predict. And looking at the environment now, if we are to see a similar environment by the time we reach 2024, this Senate map might make a lot more sense. I'm not going to waste too much more of your time just going on and on about how I think my own prediction was, in fact, accurate. Uh, but what we are going to do now is just characterize the states that can be considered to be safe for the GOP, states that outright are not going to go to the Democratic Party. That includes states such as Utah, Wyoming, Nebraska, Missouri, Indiana, Tennessee, Mississippi, North Dakota. The fascinating thing of it all is that North Carolina, North Dakota, Indiana, Tennessee, Missouri, and Mississippi were all competitive states back in 2018, but with a Republican incumbent will no longer be as such. Cindy Hyde-Smith, and not Cindy Hyde-Smith, I think uh, 
Roger Wicker if in the state of Mississippi. Yes, that is correct. He's there. The special election was competitive. Cindy Hyde Smith race was competitive. She's up in 2026. Ignore that. Mississippi, say Fred, right? Who do you have here? Marsha Blackburn defeated Phil Bredesen, the former governor of the state, very solidly by 10 points, even though it was supposed to be more competitive. Safe state. You have the state of Indiana, Mike Braun, now running for governor, but you know who's going to take his place? The governor. Eric Holcomb is going to shift up to the Senate or Victoria Sparks, maybe, from Indiana's 5th District. Oh, ultimately, though, Indiana's going red. You have uh, Josh Hawley in the state of Missouri. No chance that's competitive. And then you have... Uh, I don't remember his name uh, for some reason. Kevin Kramer, the former representative from North Dakota, he easily wins in that race. So off the bat, the GOP starts out with 47 safe states, 47 states they can rely on, which means at most the Democrats would gain two. And even then, that's a, var a very, very far stretch. Uh, Democrats have it pretty locked down in Washington, California, Hawaii. We know this from simple partisanship. Maryland joins the ranks. Uh, Delaware, New Jersey, New York, Vermont. Now, Vermont and Maine have incumbents. Angus King in Maine, uh, Bernie Sanders in Vermont, but we know both of them caucus with the Democratic Party in terms of overall party share. Um, Vermont is a safe blue state. Massachusetts, Elizabeth Warren seat, safe blue. Connecticut, Rhode Island, safe blue states when it comes down to the margins. So looking at our uh, map here, Democrats start out with about 39 safe states. Republicans are at 47. An argument can be made to me personally, and I think it's one that can be made as we look in the states of Mon uh, Minnesota, where Amy Klobuchar won her last election by 24 points, in the state of Virginia, where Tim Kaine won his last election by about 15, 16 points. Uh, but I will say that given that it will be a presidential mar uh, election, it is very possible that they do narrow down. On the general front, though, I will say uh, because Tim Kaine is such a nationalized figure, he's not going to have that pulling against him. Amy Klobuchar is a very similar type of candidate, and she's also very well-respected and well-received in the state of Minnesota, might I say. I mean, she swayed that primary for Biden back in 2020, uh, dominated in 2018, did significantly better than her counterpart, Tina Smith, who on the same ballot only won by about 11 points. Keep that in mind, right? Minnesota went to Tina Smith, the Democrat lieutenant governor, someone who had been across the state before with Tim Walls. Tina Smith won by 11. Amy Klobuchar won by 23. So a lot more crossover appeal for Klobuchar. And given its recent election results in 2022, I wouldn't bet against it, uh, looking at it from the lens of a potential Democratic victory. Virginia was a safe blue state. Uh, New Mexico, Went to Martin Heinrich by a margin of uh, 54 to 31. Now, the reason why there was uh, such a large margin is because Gary Johnson ran in this race. He was a third-party candidate, ran as a libertarian, got 15% of the vote, but the combined vote share in New Mexico ended up being uh, under... Uh, I guess Martin Heinrich only won about, by about single digits against the combined vote against him, ultimately won by a pretty significant amount. But what I will say is that I don't expect it to be a safe state in 2024. So we're starting off 47 seats for the GOP, 41 for the Democratic Party. And you can see here why 2024. I've made videos about this before, but it's commonly referred to as a very large possibility of a bloodbath. For Democrats, meaning that should Republicans sweep the remaining toss up states, and I think all of these are toss ups, you are talking about a Republican majority that is incomprehensible at this current state of mind. You know, looking at the 2020 Senate election results as well, Maine went red, right? New Mexico was six points between them. You know, Arizona was two points. Nevada on the presidential was two points. Trump won Montana. Trump won Ohio. Trump won West Virginia. Trump won Texas. Trump won Florida. Trump won Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania back in 2016. So it isn't entirely out of the question for a map to be like this. But it is extremely unlikely, given the current state of the Democratic Party and how strong they are in terms of party control across these states. I will say that there is only one real reason as to why Democrats can even have a shot at retaining Senate control, because this map obviously is so exceptionally lopsided against them. And it's because Democrats know how to win in certain regions of the country that the GOP, quite frankly, hasn't been able to do in recent time, had historically been able to do very well in Arizona, has historically been able to do very well in Texas. But we've seen narrowing ups. We've seen Democrats even have victories in some of these states. And honestly speaking, I don't see much here for uh, the GOP in terms of major, major improvements, but I see a lot of opportunities for one or two pickups, which can overturn Senate control, especially if Republicans win on the presidential level. We'll start off with our likely states, states where we have a general idea of how they're going to go. And I think a lot of it can come down to popularity rating. A lot of it can come down to, uh, you know, who's well-received and well-liked across the state. 
I will say the state of Maine at heart is a blue state. Donald Trump narrowed it up in 2016, but that's not enough to convince me that it would be a a red state in 2024. I think we could see a return of a candidate like Sarah Gideon or Shelley Pingree or Jared Golden, someone to run in this Senate election because Angus King looks like he's on his way out. No guarantee about that. But looking at the state itself, In terms of a confirmation about whether or not he's going to run, Angus King has expressed interest but has not made a decision. There are plenty of candidates, though, that have made decisions or filed paperwork to run, most notably Kirsten Sinema in the state of Arizona, who caucuses with the Democratic Party. So we'll keep that in mind as we continue on. For some of the states that I think the Republican Party will have, uh, you know, a very good shot at victory, you're talking Texas, you're talking Florida. I think these are states where we could find uh, the Republicans do, in a way, well. I think Ted Cruz would still see a narrowing down of Texas. He's an extremely unpopular and polarizing figure and not someone who really corrals his party base as much as John Cornyn or just a simple traditional Republican. Ted Cruz isn't that. In the state of uh, Florida, Rick Scott has lucked out in 2018, and I think the election showings in 2022 from a candidate similar to someone like Marco Rubio would be enough to convince me on that level that maybe someone of his stature would be able to win by an overwhelming amount. But Rick Scott isn't Marco Rubio. Rick Scott historically has had very competitive elections, and Florida hasn't exactly shown us that they love uh, Rick Scott. They have shown us that they've loved Marco Rubio, liked him in 2016, adored him in 2022. They love Ron DeSantis. But what I will also say is that we cannot deny the shift that we have seen, a significant shift, might I add, in favor of the GOP, enough so that even if Rick Scott underperforms Ron DeSantis by 10 points, he's still winning by a likely margin. And that's the environment that we have seen, uh, you know, the shift that we have seen in favor of Rick Scott, in favor of the GOP entirely in this state. We often remind ourselves that Ron DeSantis only won by 0.4 in 2018, then went on to win by 20 in 2022. So uh, different circumstances can impact uh, the outcome of the results. But Rick Scott, I don't think, is nearly as strong as Rubio or DeSantis. But that leaves us with nine remaining states, Republicans already at 49, Democrats at an abysmal 42. Now, don't get me wrong. Democrats have their own likely states and lean states. New Mexico, I'd say, would be a likely blue state. Their lean states come out of the states that they just won in back in 2022. And I can't imagine much more changes as these states increasingly get better for the Democratic Party, especially the state of Arizona. Given that there will be an incumbent and the historical Republican overestimation in Nevada, I am not confident that the GOP will improve off their 2022 margins, especially since there will be a presidential margin, uh, a presidential election coinciding with these Senate elections. It won't just be, uh, you know, uh, a midterm election where the sole focus is pushing back against the incumbent president now you're going to be fighting for an incumbent president and historically and now nevada is a blue state and i am confident they will re-elect the democrat by a narrow amount but still will go that way as they have for the past decade arizona again a growing state and increasing better state for democrats as the years go on so for right now i'd say arizona is a lean blue state but now we're boiling down to montana ohio west virginia wisconsin michigan and pennsylvania And on the baseline following these midterms, I'd say Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania are going to be states the Democrats win. Bob Casey has maintained a level of popularity that is unrivaled in Pennsylvania. And considering the current GOP field, even though Dave McCormick is better than Dr. Oz was, better than Kathy Barnett, he's not this exceptional candidate. He's not someone who's going back to this candidacy, going back to run for U.S. Senate as someone who has this huge electoral mandate. He lost against Dr. Oz. He's not exactly super strong. He's better by far, and he's going to narrow down the race when Bob Casey won the last election by an overwhelming amount. He won in this state by 13 points, but he's not going to win uh, by—he's not going to defeat Bob Casey, at least as it stands now. Debbie Stabenow defeated John James by about seven. I think it'll narrow down from there. Tammy Baldwin defeated Leah Vukmir by a margin of about 11 points across the state. I also think this one will narrow down. I could be convinced to see Wisconsin as a likely blue state, but Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania are lean blue at this point in time. So this brings us down to three remaining toss-up races, Ohio, West Virginia, and Montana. And I will say that as it stands currently, I am not confident that Joe Manchin wins in the state of West Virginia. Now, I don't think he's going to lose by much. You're talking six to seven points. But we have to recognize that states where the partisanship was too great 
for a Democratic popular incumbent to win, we have already seen them go down. We've seen what happens with Joe Donnelly in Indiana, with Claire McCaskill in Missouri, with Heidi Heitkamp in North Dakota. The plain partisanship of these states were too great. The only thing Joe Manchin and John Tester had going for them is that John Tester is very popular. Joe Manchin was as well. But Joe Manchin was the former governor. And considering that Patrick Morrissey ran one of the weakest campaigns we have seen for a Republican in West Virginia and still came within three points of defeating Joe Manchin tells me that Joe Manchin is not going to be re-upped for another six-year term from the state, regardless of how much he panders to the right. Montana and Ohio are going to determine the balance of power. The good news for Democrats is that Sherrod Brown is a strong candidate. But on the similar tune as what we've seen in West Virginia, Jim Renacci, uh, or Renacci, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the name correctly. I know uh, back in 2018, I had a bit of trouble doing it, but that was five years ago, four years ago. But the point is that regardless of that, the Republicans ran a very weak campaign in Ohio as well. I mean, we found that the frontrunner GOP nominee dropped out right before the primary, and they were rushing to choose someone, and they chose someone who wasn't able to run a strong campaign. Sherrod Brown, as the incumbent, only won by six. He was on track, according to polls, to win by 10 to 12. You saw that cut nearly in half. In a blue wave year, keep in mind 2022 was about 12 points to the right of the nation relative to 2018. And what happened with that? Ohio, even with a very poor GOP candidate, J.D. Vance, who could not run a campaign to save his life, based off what we had seen, very lackluster, very, very lackluster, Tim Ryan came only within six points. The state itself is turning on the Democratic Party, and it is clear as day. I would say, as of right now, I think Ohio narrowly goes to the GOP. I think Montana is a bit more iffy. Looking back at Montana, it reminds me a lot of what happened with Joe Manchin. But John Tester never really started off with an overwhelmingly large margin of victory. You see, in the past, we had seen Joe Manchin do very, very well in states like West Virginia. In 2010, after that vacancy occurred, let's see if I can find the special election, we found that Joe Manchin won by 10.1%, 10.1% across the state. Fast forward to 2012, he expands a 24-point margin of victory against the same exact candidate when Mitt Romney's winning the state by double digits. But then comes 2018. And this is where we can see the very clear shift, the very big difference in the outcome of the election. We go to 2018, compare it to 2012. Let's see. Uh, for some reason, it's not loading here. But if we were to compare the two, we would find that the Democratic Party did significantly worse in 2018 than they did in 2012. Let's see if I can find 2012. It doesn't look like it wants to load. But the point is, a 24-point margin narrowed down to three points doesn't exactly tell you the best news for the future of the Democratic Party in West Virginia. But in Montana, we can see that in past elections, let's say 2012, for instance, John Tester only won by 3.7. So a close race is everything that he has known. He was first elected back in 2006 by 0.88%. I think he can survive in 2024, barely. It would be contingent on Democrats doing well in that new congressional district. It would be contingent on quite a bit. But as it stands now, given the 2022 election results, Democrats have surprised us in more ways than one in Senate elections. And I think Montana could be that surprise, but I would not be shocked if Montana went red. I would not be shocked at all. In fact, it's about a 45% chance at this point from just me imagining what we can expect and where we are today in that state itself. So overall, Democrats, 49, Republicans, 51. Let's just go ahead and characterize all the states with a solid color. It'd be a little bit easier to visualize that way. I think we'd be able to see it uh, in all its glory because it shows where some of these flips are happening, where some of them aren't happening, and the overall maintenance of Republican support across some of these states. But the point is, and the baseline is, that Republicans have an overwhelmingly good shot at retaining Senate con or winning Senate control from the Democrats. And Democrats are going to have to claw their way to victory, the likes of which we had never seen, including the 2022 Senate election results. 
So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure to comment down suggestions below. Subscribe on the left if you haven't already. Check out the Instagram and Twitter. And at the bottom left of the screen, there's a Discord server that you should go ahead and join. On the screen, there's a video you can watch and then a playlist for my 2024 election analysis videos. Again, thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you all later today.